This issue of Fashion Classics, New York designers capture America's distinctive style for spring 2006. It's signature Ralph Lauren. It was a quintessential Ralph Lauren show from the nautical start to the, the French Provençal feeling, but it was just very romantic, very updated. The Southwest gets an urban attitude at Michael Coors. It's the idea that you can take something that's romantic um, and mix it with something austere. Um, it's really a blend of the two. I think the mixing is definitely something that this decade will be all about. Americana is center stage at Marc Jacobs with schoolgirl uniforms, prom queens, and a marching band. I, I just think it's like such a moving and charged and beautiful sound, this marching band and the energy. Victoria's Secret celebrates 10 years of scintillating success with an exhibition hosted by sexy supermodel Giselle Bunchen. The outfits, you cannot really wear it, you know? I mean, if you start walking around like this, I mean, people might think you're crazy. So, I mean, I don't think you can wear it, you can make one, but I'm not responsible for anything that might happen to you in the street. And legendary American beauty Lauren Hutton is celebrated by Big Magazine. I feel like I've outed myself. Stay tuned for more Modern Americana next. While Mark was busy overseeing last-minute preparations for the presentation of his spring-summer 2006 collection, his beauty team feverishly created a look with a bit of a high school twist. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a prom girl, like just very easy. Clothes are very stylized, beautiful Mark Jacob collection. So just offsetting it with very easy kind of not grungy, but kind of homemade -y kind of hair, very easy, like no big deal. The big deal happened front of house. Mark's diehard celebrity fans fills the venue. I think that Mark is consistent in the fact that his clothes are wearable, and I think he's consistent in the fact that his clothes are interesting. And personally, I love him as a dear friend, so I'll always wear Marc Jacobs. You know, I'm a late bloomer to the fashion world. I've come into it a little bit later. But I just, um, I just think he's really kind of inventive, you know. And with guys, his stuff fits me really well, and it's kind of classic. And it makes me, uh, it makes me look taller because I'm a medium-sized Jewish man. With his celebrities front row, Showtime kicked off at a more civilized hour, unlike the season before, as Mark opened the show with the help of the Penn State Blue Band. I just think it's like such a moving and charged and beautiful sound, this marching band, and it gives people a great feeling and they feel it inside. And, you know, it's just another one of those wonderful things in life. <laughs> We were ready at 8 o'clock. A lot of editors were in here. Anna Winter came backstage and she said, so what? So what? They're not here. Start without them. That'll teach them. And it's like, no, I'm afraid it'll teach me. Because, you know, I'm the one who's starting late. They're the ones who think he's never going to start on time. Then I start the show for an empty stadium. You know, that's not so good. I thought it was amazing. But I think the clothes were so beautiful and sophisticated and experimental in a good way, where they made you think, you know, how big should a cuff be? How big can a shoulder be? How, you know, how youthful can an evening dress be? They asked a lot of questions about fashion and sort of answered them in very beautiful and quite quiet ways. So it was sort of, to me, a, a, a mix of the best that the Japanese do when they do it right and what Mark does, which is to do everything very clean and very American at the same time. I watched uh, some rather dark high school movies thinking about sort of American ceremonies and the proms and I don't know, you know, I think after Fall, which was so black, I thought, well, what, what kind of American ceremonies would like? So I thought, well, the prom, all those lovely colors and sort of, you know, sort of paled out whites and beiges and pale pinks and lavenders and stuff. And then I also thought about uniforms and school uniforms and the sort of chicness and the severity of that to sort of contrast the sort of sweetness. I was also thinking about clothes and thinking about sport clothes, formal clothes, you know, all the times of day. Well, I think it was his way of um, hitting back at all those critics who are saying, you know, oh, it's too European, it's too dark, it's a bit Yoji, it's a bit Romeo Gigli, it's a bit 
junior, you know. And I think he wanted to show that he really is an all-American boy. It's nice to see um, a young American designer come up, to see so many great European labels, but then like to see someone following the steps of Calvin Klein, that kind of thing, is, it's real nice. We're a big fan of Marc Jacobs, you know, he has, you know, great style and just great everything, so we love him, he's awesome. And what makes Marc so awesome is not only his design talent, but his disarming frankness on any subject. If anybody ever asks me stuff, I tell them the answer. I mean, you know, everyone always asks me, like, what was the inspiration for a show? But if they ask me, you know, like, who did you last have sex with, I tell them the answer. <laughs> and there's, unfortunately, it was about 20 years ago now. It's a joke. I'm a huge fan. Because I've never worn anything of Marc Jacobs that's made me feel uncomfortable. Everything I wear makes me feel so comfortable, and I love I've never disliked anything he's ever made. It's all a learning process. It's like you do things. I think there were really good things in here. They're probably, once I see the tape, tomorrow I'll hate everything. But tonight, you know, there'll be things that I thought, oh, we could have done that a little better, or maybe it should have been a different way of achieving that look, you know, whatever. But it's, you know, I always say it's like really good to think that way because it gives you a reason to get up tomorrow and do it all over again. It's a sure sign you're at a Ralph Lauren show when Lux cars pull up. Well, he'll guess converge outside and the Lauren clan is inside. With everyone settled in, the audience was treated to the designer's signature American classics confirming that relaxed and refined are synonymous with summer. I thought Ralph Lauren was also really incredibly beautiful. It was a quintessential Ralph Lauren show from the nautical start to the, the French Provençal feeling, but it was just very romantic, very updated. Lauren didn't have to stretch his aesthetic too far to come up with the crisp nautical outfits and denim so perfectly faded and patched. It looked more delicate than worn. The use of shirting fabrics was extremely light and romantic, an elegant menswear-inspired touch. It has come to be expected of Ralph Lauren, the master of manufacturing the American dream, to create sportswear that conveys this coveted lifestyle. It's interesting because I'm always amazed at how he takes his aesthetic and just keeps riffing on it and riffing on it and riffing on it. What I liked about it were the way that I thought you could pull his pieces apart. Uh, in the show, when he did patchwork, it was patchwork from head to toe. A patchwork jacket, a full patchwork skirt, a lot of beautiful ruffles which in the show I thought looked a little bit on the costume side, but once you started pulling things apart and incorporating them into your wardrobe, it looked right. It was just clothes you want to wear. Everybody looks so beautiful. Big Magazine celebrated iconic beauty model Lauren Hutton with their latest issue. Entitled Lauren Hutton, The Beauty Persists, the magazine covers Hutton's professional and personal life. And it all started because we wanted to do a beauty issue as a theme for, for Big Magazine and we kind of looked at the market and it seemed like it was geared so much so for teenagers, or at least teenagers were kind of representing the idea of eternal beauty, but I think about the history of living through life, it has certain amount of beauty that combined with the general like beauty that we all recognize that we think it has a lot more depth, you know, than, than the other project. And that was the whole idea behind the project, you know. I feel like I've outed myself. I ever never let anyone know anything about my trips. I never let anyone know anything about my friends. And I certainly didn't let anyone know about guys I who were my lovers, ever. So, 
Like I say, I basically just gave Alex a key to my apartment. So I guess I feel like I've outed myself in a way. Well, you know, it's okay. The cost was like the perfect subject for uh, the project, you know? She was the first supermodel. She has always lived this very intensive and unusual life. And she's a very she's a huge icon. You know? Well, you have to make yourself into your own icon, always. But I learned a lot. And one of them is find out what it is that you love and, you know, spend a lot of time doing it, whatever it is. And not what your boyfriend loves, your mother loves, your husband loves. Find out what you, what moves you. And Hutton was moved to bear all. At 61, Hutton agreed to pose nude for photographer Mario Sorrenti. These are the first nudes of Hutton ever published. I know Mario for a long time, and he made me extremely comfortable. And then I forgot him, and he sort of forgot me, and I thought about the last time I had made love, which fortunately had been pretty recent. And I just rolled around in bed thinking about love. So it was pretty easy. And you climbed a very rich life. So On purpose. It doesn't come by dreaming. You gotta have a dream, but then you gotta work at it. Receiving the CFDA award for Ready to Wear last season wasn't taken lightly by Vera Wang, whose claim to fame began by designing dream-inducing bridal gowns. I'm still in shock. That hasn't worn off. It's just been sort of undercut by this state of tension I'm in before a show. Focusing in on her summer show, Wang's beauty look is a bit new frontier goes cosmopolitan. I think how women looked in the Wild West is how they define themselves. Their role in society very much played into how they looked. It's hard to believe that Wang could find synergy between master painter Matisse and the tawdry Wild West TV series Deadwood. She did, and the results were brilliantly crafted clothes. I think Deadwood is so gritty and real the Far West, and the, the women, although Deadwood's ostensibly about men and cowboys and a pioneer town, a frontier in South Dakota, the most important part of the series is about women. And those four amazing women, and it could be Trixie the Whore, or it could be, you know, the Widow Garrett. So we really had the Black Widow, and we had the Tomboy, and we had, you know, the Lady from back east. And we had the head of a brothel. And the whole point about these four women is they all have courage and they all grow. They're, they're just incredible. They're incredible characters. And the juxtaposition of a safe, you know, benign, wonderful world that Matisse creates, it's all romantic and sensual and sophisticated. Opposite these, these women that are so tough and gritty and they have to survive, I just thought it was a great counterpoint for the two. The colors are very much Matisse. He's probably one of his, was one of the greatest colorists in the history of painting, and I think served as a great inspiration for anyone who loves color. He never made color vulgar, and he never minimized. He always made it sophisticated and charming and optimistic. The details are very hard to make. Um, the complexity is in the cutting of the clothes. And I think, um, you know, that's something we pride ourselves on. The craftsmanship of the clothes, my attitude about women, which is that women should be modern and, and not in your face sexy, that's something, but seductive and a little mysterious, I think that's always there. Blast, the backstage activity was in full swing for the legendary house of American fashion. Less interested in wooing the press, Blast designer Michael Volbrack concentrated on keeping the label's affluent customers swooning over his summer collection. We're doing well. Even though the, a lot of the press have not liked what I've done because I don't do edgy clothes because our customers do not like edgy clothes. They just want beautiful wearable clothes 
even though they'll wear them twice. Why they're wearing them, they want them to be wearable and beautiful. That's what they want, and that's what I'm here to do, give it to them. I think that's a smart thing to do, because I like real women. One of my jobs is, after you see all these luscious girls who are size four, and they are like uh, these ethereal things, I've got to go back into a, to a, to fittings of a size eight and a 10 for real women, and that's one of the most important parts of my job, is to make real women happy. Glass loyalists are sure to be more than pleased with the 1960s style classics refreshed with a French touch. Hoping to attract a younger clientele, the designer enlisted the help of model Electra Wiedemann, daughter of Isabella Rossellini. I like this collection especially because I feel like a kind of he really incorporated kind of classic blast cuts with kind of new, kind of younger patterns and designs and beading and embroidery and stuff and I think that that is going to be something that's going to have a big response you know over a wide age range I think that the classic cuts are going to complement older women and the young kind of embroidery and sparkling and stuff is going to be something that appeals to the younger you know 20 year old 30 year old Easy clothes with beautiful fabrics. Bill Blass always is known for the best fabrics. And when I go to Paris and to Rome and to uh, Zurich to buy the fabrics, I've never asked the price, which is a wonderful thing because I just know our customer always wants the best. And that's, we have to keep the clothes secondary to the fabrics. We are one of the few really couture houses in, in this country. So when I go to Omaha or I go to Kansas City, I have a customer who has paid sixty, seventy thousand dollars last season. I'm going to make her happy. Even with Catherine Zeta-Jones and Michael Douglas, Hollywood's Academy Award-winning couple in attendance at Michael Kors, the designer continued to work the backstage of his summer show. models were deep in makeup and hair. The look today is inspired uh, by Louise Dahl Wolf, and it's kind of a, of a weathered bun in the back. Um, it's got a lot of texture, there's flyaways, it's not perfectly done. Um, it should look like a girl that's kind of been out in the desert. It's really the romantic and the severe combined. So I started thinking about movies like Giant. And I, I, you, know, you think about Liz Taylor and Rock Hudson and Giant, they had a romanticism to them, but it was rustic. And then you go out west and you think, wait a second, all of the American icons, people like Louise Dahl Wolf, George O'Keefe, Steiglitz, Slim Keith, there was always a severity to it. I think it's like time for the bling to go away, time for anything that's so overtly sexy that you sort of need to go like this and you know feel shocked. It's the idea that you can take something that's romantic um, and mix it with something austere. Um, it's really a blend of the two. I think the mixing is definitely something that this decade will be all about. For men, we start playing with a lot of fabric experimentation. And one of the things that I always love, I like lived in clothes. Um, and I love texture for men. So we've taken a lot of the classic fabrics, things like camouflage, things like a great chino jacket, and we've woven them with a little bit of metal in them. So they have this sort of crushed attitude, feel lived in, but then still feel fabulous to the hand. I think Michael Kors had a very good collection. Um, and he hit the right notes, and our customers are really liking Michael's clothes at this time, and I think they'll continue to do so for spring. People really are hunting for those special pieces. Uh, it's the kind of thing that, you know, 20 years from now, you'll take out and say, look at that incredible hand-embroidered lace skirt. Look at the brass embroidery on that, uh, that suede dress. All of those things make them the kind of clothes that just get better with time. It's definitely, um, it's definitely the most romantic show that I've ever done. I think that I'm finding our customers for the first time, pretty is not a dirty word. It's always sexy, sexy, sexy. Well, this is still sexy, but it's sexy in a much less in your face way. Modesty without being prim. You know, I think it's hard to go from like 
full pole dancer to librarian in six months. It's still definitely sexy, but at the same time, there, there is a bit of discretion to the whole thing. Nothing has entered the modern American culture recently like Victoria's Secret. And a New York City exhibit of some of their most flamboyant showpieces proved that. Giselle Bunchen, one of their certified angels, was on hand to give us the details. Victoria's Secret has decided to make an exhibit of the 10 years of sexy. So they pick like the 43 outfits that they found like the sexiest or the best outfits in the last 10 years of their fashion shows and put in an exhibit and put it in the store in order for the people who don't have the opportunity to go and watch the fashion show to come and take a look at it. I think they wanted to show like how these things, how they look in real life. So they have archives and they have these huge wings that Heidi wore and they're like 12 feet high. And I mean, you're thinking like, how the hell is this person wearing this wing, right? And it's just like so much work into it. They spend 150 hours making that. And then if you want to see, like they have the fantasy gift, you know, so the people, the clients of Victoria's Secret who know about the fantasy gift. This is the $15 million replica of the Ruby bra that I wore in 2000. So they have things like that. They're like part of the history of Victoria's Secret. Victoria's Secret has grown so much in the last 10 years and I think it's important to keep track and like, you know, see how far have you gone and where you were before. And I think it's kind of like that too, even with the outfits, you can see how they have changed. They have become more like crazy throughout the years. And, and I think that's pretty cool too, to see the history of Victoria's Secret. I mean, I think that's what they're trying to show. It's something different too. It's another like exciting thing in the store, just to like, while you shop, you take a look and check out how you know, things were when they, how they look like in real life, from the runway to real life. And not that the runway is not real life, but I think they're just trying to show to the people how they actually look the outfits, because you, you can look at something, but when you see them from real life, you kind of like understand the magnitude of this, because I mean, look at the size of those wings even, look at that gold one, I mean, it's crazy, and it's so heavy. I think it's heavy. The Victoria's Secret Show has continued to grow each year. What began as a small show at the Plaza Hotel is now a multi-million dollar extravaganza that is seen by more than 10 million people around the world. The Victoria's Secret Fashion Show is not a fashion show, really. Here is about like a show. The outfits, you cannot really wear it, you know? I mean, if you start walking around like this, I mean, people might think you're crazy. So, I mean, I don't think you cannot wear it, you can make one, but I'm not responsible for anything that might happen to you on the streets.